so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. Then you can check out our latest blog post, you can look at our latest podcast, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Now, as you go through this message, I pray that God works life change into your life, and welcome to Church on the Rock. Uh, Matthew chapter 9. We talked a little bit last week about New Year's resolutions and that type thing, and we're going to kind of stay in that vein today. I want to talk about change. Change. Um, Somebody said the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Um, It's one reason we're doing Financial Peace University. We're going to get some tools and learn how to do things differently. Because if you keep doing the same thing with your money you've always done and you're broke, you're going to stay broke. We have to learn how to change. And um, change is is a good thing. We hear a lot about change and we hear about how hard it is to change and people don't like to change. We go to conferences and you can hardly ever go to a conference when you don't hear about um, how hard it is to get a church to change or people to change and people are resistant to change. And I've even preached that and taught that. Um, But for the purpose of this message this morning, I want to tell you, I believe people love change. I believe people pray for change, want change, desire change, hunger after change. The problem is we want the change to be in other people, don't we? We love change. We just want other people to change. We want our spouse to change. We want our kids to change. We want our friends to change. We want our enemies to change. We, we, we love change. We just love it in other people. We can tell you how the Democrats need to change. We can tell you how the Republicans need to change. We can tell you how the Baptists need to change and how the Catholics need to change and how the homosexuals need to change and how the drug addicts need to change. We want everybody to change except us. We love change. We, we, sometimes, sometimes we may even want change in ourselves. If, if we didn't, we wouldn't spend thousands of dollars trying to change ourselves, right? We want to lose weight or we want to grow hair or we want to gain muscle or we want to, well, there's things about ourselves that we want to change. We try to change our income. We try to change our social status. We try to change our credit report. There's things about us that we want to change. The problem with us is we want change with no pain. We want change with no discipline, no work, no effort. And it's too easy for us to pray, God, bless me. God, change me. God, do a work in me. And and God said, every time I try to change you, you cry foul. Every time I try to bless you, you screw it up. I mean, it's like getting in your car and you leave here and you want to go to Florida and you get on I-10, but instead of going east, you turn west heading toward Texas. And you're, you're, you're in, you know, down there in Louisiana saying, God, help me, bless me, get me to Florida, get me this. And you can pray till you're blue in the face, but you're not getting to Florida till you stop, turn around, change, and go the other way. At some point, you've got to change. We're asking God to make these changes. God says, I can't bless you. I can't change you. Change, if I try to change you, it'll only destroy you. You see, we, we, have you ever wondered, why don't we see the tangible miracles that we read about in the Bible, that we see all these things that God did? You ever wonder, why don't we see those 
abundantly today? Why don't we see the sick just being healed? And why don't we see these, these awesome things of, of God? And, and I mean, every, we know every breath we take is a miracle. The fact that I can go to sleep and my heart keeps beating and my lungs keep pumping, we know that's a miracle from God. But I'm talking about when I say tangible, I mean when we pray and we see God pour out the financial blessing or the physical blessing or whatever it is, see God do. Well, I have a theory, and my, my theory is based on the assumption that we're not ready for the miracles. We're not ready for the miracles. You remember when, the, when Jesus, he tells us that, that he couldn't work many miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief? So it tells me there's things we can do to hinder the miracles. It didn't say he wouldn't do it. He said he couldn't do it. He said, I can't do miracles here. You're not ready for it. You don't believe. You're not, you're not at a place where you can handle miracles. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Uh, let's read verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. That right there is it's a different sermon, but I think that's so cool. Tax collectors were the scum of society. They were cheats. They were robbers. They would charge anything they wanted for taxes. They would give what little bit was owed to the government. The rest went in their pockets. They were the lowest of the low, and everybody knew it, and nobody could do anything about it, kind of like paying taxes today. They say all you have to do is die and pay taxes. You know, that's, but you, you got to pay it whether you like it or not. And that's, but they were extortioners. And along comes Jesus. He doesn't preach to him. He doesn't witness to him. He doesn't tell him how wrong he is. He doesn't try to change. He just says, follow me. And it says, he did. That's the awesome thing about Jesus. There was something so attractive about Jesus that it didn't matter who you were. When he said, follow you, you just wanted to follow him. All right. And then the next thing was so cool. Matthew threw a party at his house. And he invited all of his scum buddies. And then he invited Jesus and his buddies. And they threw a party. Let's read. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. <laughs> but when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? I love it. I know churches that throw, they, they call them Matthew parties. They'll have people come in the church and, and, and accept Christ, and sometime they're, you know, they're drug addicts and gang members and this and that, but they come in and they find Christ, and they'll ask them, throw a Matthew party. Invite your friends, invite your buddies, invite them, and we're going to bring a few folks from the church, and they just come over and they just have a party. They don't, they don't preach to them or try to beat you. Know, they just have a party. They just bring them together. And that's what was happening here. I mean, it, it's, uh, Jesus is just sitting around and high-fiving and laughing and eating. And they said, why is your master eating with such scum? Well, Jesus heard this, and he says to them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not sacrifice. For I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners. One day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we do and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, do wedding guests mourn when celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. All right, what does that mean? 
New cloth on old garments, new wine and old bottles. What does all this mean? Jesus is saying this in response to these accusations by the Pharisees. They're upset because Jesus is breaking all the rules, which he was very good at, by the way. He was the original rebel with a cause. I mean, he, he went against every rule he broke. He's making disciples out of tax collectors. He's eating with sinners. He's hanging around the wrong crowd. He, he's just not acting very religious at all. And the religious leaders are upset. They want him to change. Isn't it funny? We can get to the place we even want God to change. Right? We want God God said we're created in his image. We want to create God in our image. We even want God to change. They're asking God to change. They don't like the way Jesus, the Son of God, is doing things. So Jesus responds to them in verse number 12. He says, when he heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. Well, I mean, you may as well just slap them in the face. You, sitting around here with this bunch, walking around with a bunch of heathen you call disciples, you're telling us to go learn? You're going to teach us how to live? We're the spiritual authorities. We're the religious leaders. You, and we're going to learn from, you want to teach us about how to live? I mean, that, that right there was enough to start a fight. And, 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 and then... He goes on and tells them, uh, then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. Well, if the other didn't do it, this did it. I mean, uh, mercy, they, they didn't even care about, they knew nothing about mercy. Now, sacrifice, they understood. You sin, you kill an animal, you take it to the temple, you sacrifice it on the temple, that's how you deal with, you're walking around talking about mercy and loving sinners and all of this stuff, and, and you know, we're, we're not going to have any part of that. And Jesus then responds with this little ditty here, and he says, who would put uh, old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine, ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. All right, what is that? A new cloth on an old garment. Um, if you're under 40, you probably don't even get this. If you're over 40, you understand. You had a pair of britches, you climb a fence, you rip a hole in it, you don't go get new britches. Mama cuts a piece of cloth out of somewhere she's got, and she sews a patch on the britches. Now you got a new pair of britches with a patch on it. Now you go pay extra money to buy pants that already have holes in them. The Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> anyway, um, but a patch. But what happens is, how many have ever bought, say, a shirt, and you got it, that thing, it fit just right, it you know, looks good, does this, and you take it, and you wear it, you know, and you like it, and you say, it's my favorite shirt, and you wash it, and you dry it, and you get it out of the dryer, and it looks like a kid's shirt. <laughs> Why? Because garments tend to shrink. They shrink. And so once you've washed it, maybe you bought it a little big and you washed it and dried it and it shrunk and it still fits good. Everything's good on it, but you get a hole in it. And so you, you get a new piece of cloth and you sew a patch on it. And he said, what happens is the patch has never shrunk before, so now the patch shrinks. And what it does, it doesn't, just, it doesn't just mess up the patch, it actually rips the shirt and makes the tear worse. That, that's, that's what he said. He said, who would put a patch, of, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink 
and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. So not only does it not help the patch, it doesn't help the garment. The garment gets tore even worse than before. So that's what he's talking about. And then he goes into this, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. A wineskin was a, basically it was a bottle. Uh, I think the King James translates it a bottle, but it was a skin made usually out of goat skin or something. And it was formed in the, the, the shape of a bottle or a vase or something like that. And it was soft and it was pliable and they would pour the wine into it. And that's what they would carry it in. But Wine, they would put unfermented wine in there, and as the wine would begin to ferment, it would put off a gas, and so it would begin to expand. Well, that's okay if you have a new wine skin because it's soft, it's pliable, and it just expands with it and becomes bigger. But once the wine skin gets old and sits out in the sun and it, it begins to get hard and it begins to get brittle, and, and so if you put new wine in there, and it begins to ferment, pretty soon that old wine skin cracks. And not only do you lose your wine, but you actually destroy the wine skin because it cracks and breaks away, and it's no good. No one puts new wine into old wine skins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. I think it's interesting that in both cases, he says, leaving an even bigger tear in the garment than before, and also that the, the, uh, it spills the wine, but it also ruins the skin. So he said, not only are you not, you're not getting the good, but you're making the bad even worse. And so that's the example that Jesus is, is trying to use here. Uh, both cases, we're trying to do a good thing, a new thing, but the new thing actually damages the old thing. Now, how many of you have ever asked God for a new thing? God, we want revival in our church. God, we want a change in our homes. We want a change in our marriage. We want you to do a work in our families. God, I need you to do a work in my finances. I need a miracle. And we want to see miracles and change and healing and restoration. And we want to see God move. But too often, we, we, don't, we don't see the healing. We don't see the miracles. We don't see the financial blessing. We don't see God moving. And here's the reason reason why, God says, if I were to bring miracles to your church, if I were to bring healing, if I were to bring financial blessings into your church, he said, not only would it not bless you, it would destroy you. You couldn't handle it. You're not, you're not ready for it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it would tear, how many, how many have ever seen someone passes away and they get an inheritance. They get this money. They get a blessing. All of a sudden, what happens? They get tore apart. You got, you got siblings that won't talk to each other. You got to all of a sudden, they hate each other. Why? Because they got a blessing, and they couldn't handle the blessing. They weren't ready for the blessing. I preached a message one time called, Can You Stand to Be Blessed? Some folks can't stand to be blessed. God gives them a blessing, and it tears them apart. It just, it, it, it not only does it not bless them, but it ruins what's already there. And, and that's what it is. God's saying, you know, not only would this not bless you, but it would destroy you in the process. It would tear you apart like an old garment. Um, why? Because the skins, the garments, the covering, we are the skins. That's the point of this. We are the vessels. We are the garment. And God says, unless the vessel changes, unless the garment changes, then any miracle that I, any new wine I pour in is just, not only is it not going to bless you, it's going to destroy you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to tear you apart. It's going to do more damage than it does good. And unfortunately, much of the church today is like an old shirt. We've shrunk. When I say we've shrunk, I mean we've become so narrow-minded. We've become so narrow-minded as far as reaching the lost. We're not willing to go and learn. We're not willing to go and be taught how to reach the lost. 
We're not willing to go and learn. We, we know what we're doing. We know how to have church. We're not, we're not, we're not interested in growing and reaching out into our community. We, we, we don't want to, and, and as a result, we become like old wineskins. We become hard. We become brittle. And it's no wonder God's not pouring out new wine. It's no wonder God's not doing things. He said, if I tried, it would probably just do more damage than good. In other, in order, uh, other words, for, for change to take place, for real miracles to happen, for healing to happen, for restoration, for financial blessing, the garment and the vessel has to be willing to change also. See, we, we, we love these old songs like, you know, give me that old time religion. If it was good enough for grandpa, it was good enough for me. And, all, and I, I, that sounds so spiritual and sounds, the truth is, The truth is, what worked 50 years ago doesn't necessarily work today. Don't get, don't get, the message hadn't changed, but the method has got to change. The gospel hasn't changed, but the church has got to change and grow and adapt to the needs of the lost today. We live in a different world than we did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we had no need to to, uh, minister to AIDS victims. We didn't know what it was, right? Today we do. We, 50 years ago, we had no need to, to have ministries that dealt with people hooked on internet pornography. People didn't know what an internet was. That was a net inside another net. I don't know, internet, that's the internet. That's the outer net. Who knows? We didn't know that. Today, we have real problems with that. 50 years ago, we really didn't need divorce recovery classes because nobody got divorced. I mean, if they did, it was a rare thing. You know, it was something today, over 50% of marriages end in divorce. We need to be ministering there. So we have to grow. We have to change. We have to learn how to minister to these people. We want revival and healing and miracles, but are we willing to go and learn what these things mean? We pray, Lord, give us our city. I've heard, so I get so sick of people, I laugh at them now. Lord, give us our city. We want this city. We claim this city. I'm thinking, if this city came in here this morning, what in the heck would we do? We ain't got nowhere for them to sit. We ain't have enough communion. What, what you gonna do with your city? We're not ready for a city. We're not ready. So we pray for things that we can't even handle. We pray for things we're not even ready for. We pray, you know, we, we, we have to be willing to grow and willing to change. We have to get ready for our city before our city gets here. I'm going to tell you something. You know, you know a sad thing? It would tear most churches apart if homosexuals started coming into their church. Tear them apart. What are we going to do? You realize that? They're here. What are we going to do? Well, try loving them. Try loving them. It tear, it tear churches apart. If, if drug addicts and alcoholics started. Now, we sit there and we say, Lord, send us the loss. Send us, Lord, send us hurting people. Send us people here. Send. And when he does, we, we freak out. What do we do? We make them leave. And I tell you, I'm preaching the truth because I've had people leave because homosexual people came to church. I'm thinking, seriously? Not only do these people get hurt, but I'm telling you the whole church suffers. The whole church suffers whether you realize it or not. It breaks down something in the whole church. Church, our job Our mandate is to love people. Jesus never shied away from people. Wherever wherever they were, whatever their their lives, whatever their condition, he never shied away. He, He sat down, he loved them. The Bible says the goodness of God leads men to repentance. There's a movie, one of my favorite movies, called A Few Good Men. Old movie, but I love it when Tom Cruise is a lawyer and he's got Jack Nicholson on the stand and it's getting heated back and forth, back and forth. He's trying to get a confession out of him. Tom Cruise says, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson says, 
You can't handle the truth. And I'm afraid most churches today just can't handle the truth. God says, you can't handle the truth. You can't handle miracles. You can't handle healing. You can't handle the lost people. You're praying and asking me for lost people, and I send lost people, and you freak out. You can't handle lost people. You can't, ha you can't handle revival. If you had revival, it'd scare you to death. If I started healing sick, you'd run out. You wouldn't know what, you, you would, you'd say it was a devil or something. You're not willing to change the vessel. He said, I'm still dealing with old vessels. Listen, this is, this is one reason we're offering Financial Peace University. This is one reason we're, we got to learn to grow. We want change. We're praying, God, bless me, bless me. God says, I'm trying. I got a class for you. Join it. Learn how to manage your money. Why wouldn't you? You, you know, get in church. You, you, you're struggling with this, struggling with that. Find a place. Ask questions. Find out how to deal with it. Quit doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. See, changing the garment is what's hard. Changing the skin. The, the new wine is a piece of cake. We can see where others need to change, but changing ourselves is difficult because we think we're right. We're so sure we're right, just like the Pharisees, we're too right to change. But Jesus said, go and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. The key to seeing God move is learning and changing. And I'll tell you the truth, most Christians are either too lazy or too proud to go and learn anything. Don't tell me. You can't tell me. I've been preaching here. I've been an elder. I've been going to this church since I was knee high to ground. You can't teach me. I, I know that. And that's our attitude. But the Bible said God resisteth the proud. In fact, one of the things it says, the Bible tells us seven things. It says God hates. And one of them is a proud heart. God says, I'm looking for people that's willing to grow, that's willing to change. Some people say, well, bless God, I still believe the same thing I did 50 years ago. And I think, you poor thing. You haven't grown one bit in 50 years? I shudder to go back. Thank God they don't make cassette players any day, in these days. Because some of my old sermons on cassettes, I think, oh, but did I say that? Thank God we can grow and we can change. I was born Baptist, I'll die Baptist. Well, you may be dead already. You just need to check. It's not that it's hard for God to do stuff or God doesn't. It's just we need to change so he can do it without destroying us. Real change happens to the skin. Real change happens to the vessel. The new wine is easy. God has new wine abundantly. And, and let me take it a step further. Let's get out of the wine and go back to the garment. If you change the garment, you really don't even need the patch anymore, do you? <laughs> There's really even no need for a patch if you change the garment. Change the garment, you're good to go. I saw a quote this week. Once you begin looking for the good in your spouse, you stop looking for the bad. I thought that's so good. That's change. We always want change, change, change. But start looking for the good. But whatever you look for, you'll find. That goes in your marriage. That goes in your church. That goes on your job. That goes with your friends. That goes with your enemies. Whatever you look for, you'll find. You look for the good, you'll find some good. You look for the bad, you're going to find the bad. I want to see the miracles. I want to see the healing. I want to see God moving. I, 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 but, but the secret is growing and learning. We just keep building bigger and bigger and bigger buildings and bringing in more and more and more people. But if we're not learning and changing, we're, we're, just, we're just putting the same old people and the same old attitudes and the same old prejudice into the buildings. All we've got is giant nurseries. But when we're willing to go and learn, 
when we're willing to change, when we're willing to be taught, then we're ready for the miracles. Again, we're so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message encouraged you in any way, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org and let us know about it. Those type of messages encourage us as we work throughout the week. While you're there, check out our latest podcast or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a blessed week.